For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson with the latest readout video from our free weekly email newsletter to which you should subscribe so we can stay in touch if we get knocked off our online roost and also an appreciative whistle to all those watching in Miami, Florida, 43rd on our total view list. A whistle in particular because this week we lead off with a moment of uncharacteristic enthusiasm from Scientific American which forgot the iron rule that climate change ruins everything long enough to blurt out, quote, we are in the golden age of bird watching. There has never been a better time to be or become a birder, end quote. Yeah, yeah, supposedly global warming is killing everything nice, definitely including migratory birds, but now a mere eyewitness says, quote, one of nature's greatest spectacles is unfolding, the migration of billions of birds to their breeding grounds. They've spent the winter in balmier locales to the south, getting fat on insects, seeds, fruits, and aquatic plants and prey. Now they're winging their way north to establish territories, find mates, and raise their young, end quote, as it, um gets warmer and balmier and more life-friendly in the north. But not to worry, climate doom is never more than a few paragraphs away. Or a few clicks. Thus, something called Nature Canada declares, quote, migratory birds are particularly vulnerable to climate change effects because they depend on multiple habitats and sites, end quote. And then it urges us to enjoy nature before telling us the whole thing's a flaming wreck. And yes, a Google search will yield endless variations on this depressing theme. Yet there's author Kate Wong in Scientific American rhapsodizing that before the COVID lockdown, she neither knew nor cared from birds. She recognized a few common ones at her feet are like the blue jay, but for instance, quote, gulls were just seagulls, terns were just terns, end quote. And admittedly, the Seagull Fanciers Club may still be able to hold its meetings in a small room with everyone holding tight to their snacks, but... With the lockdowns, her life took a turn, and she found herself staring out the window, clutching a bird identification app, and logging observations on a website. Behold, we say, the greater online nerd in her native habitat. But in a good way. Except for the part where she reigns on her own parade, with, quote, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that birds around the world are in a state of dramatic decline because of climate change and habitat loss from human activity. In 2022, researchers estimated that the North American bird population had lost nearly 3 billion breeding adults since 1970, end quote. Well, that sounds like habitat loss if it started in 1970, though apparently it's been mitigated by warming later on, which may be heresy, but the fact is that Wong does end chirpily with, quote, we're living in the golden age of birding, and like any good cult member, I'm recruiting people to the cause, end quote. Sounds like a plan even if we gaze at our feeder and spot, yet again, the common vexing squirrel, a.k.a. Sciurius carolinensis obnox. And another thing. No sooner had we shown that if you add back in the data from before 1979, there's no secular trend in the last half century of Arctic sea ice extent, and that it was rebounding in early 2024, than the Arctic doomsters and sea lioners said, who said extent? It's volume that matters. And as we complained in the last readout, that's clearly a bait and switch, since they sure cared about extent when they thought it supported their cause. But, okay, let's talk volume. The Polar Science Center, a network of researchers operating out of the University of Washington, maintains a POMAS data series. POMAS here stands for Pan-Arctic Ice Ocean Modeling and Assimilation System, that shows volume more or less tracking extent from 1979 to the present. Meaning, yes, it has been going down, but it hasn't been going down since 2012, which is rather odd if the crisis has been accelerating since blah blah blah. Speaking of when it's been accelerating since, for pre-1979 data, you have to battle hordes of formats and qualifiers on their website to get to this chart, which shows, uh, levels consistently lower in the 1960s than the vast majority of years since, only up to 2010, which is when this particular chart stops. Now, this isn't direct measurement, it's reanalysis. But as far as it goes, it shows no crisis. And while they do insist that 2023 was ninth lowest on record, take that with a grain of sea salt, because, of course, the modern satellite record only covers 45 years, meaning it's only in the bottom fifth of the period for which we do have that kind of satellite data. Unscary kids. Also in the newsletter, we bring you the climate crisis in a nutshell. Reuters Sustainable Switch emails, quote, African leaders called this week for rich countries to commit record contributions to new financing amid rising extreme weather events on the continent, end quote. But 
there aren't rising extreme weather events on the continent, Western nations are not going to fork over vast sums, and African leaders wouldn't spend them fixing the weather if we did. But instead of taking a skeptical look, Reuters quotes some character who only escaped ICC prosecution because of, quote, the withdrawal of key prosecution witnesses, end quote, saying that whatever this thing was is historic. Ah, and we also note that the EV House of Cards continues to collapse. An article in the American Spectator explains that a key to Tesla's dazzling success was that it, quote, allowed car manufacturers to offset their carbon footprints by purchasing credits from Elon Musk in lieu of making EVs themselves, end quote. But that market is collapsing because various government EV mandates, quote, serve to prod the manufacture of battery-powered devices by every other vehicle manufacturer, end quote, so, quote, they no longer needed to pay Tesla for credit to offset the zero-emissions vehicles they hadn't been manufacturing, end quote. And let's be frank here. Musk has always been suspected of being a bit more of a subsidy farmer than a real entrepreneur. And unless he can now start selling cars that consumers want at a price that they can afford, or convince governments to give him a captive market, the ride will be over. And another thing. New York Times columnist Peter Coy wrote an interesting piece about how, quote, our brains don't do randomness, end quote, and therefore a lot of people read too much meaning into coincidences and do it too often. Now, Coy respects the human mind's tendency to search for patterns, but nevertheless he winds up, quote, coincidences can be surprisingly fruitful at times, just don't get all Agent Mulder. Most of the time, it's just a coincidence, end quote. And we say, don't get all Agent Michael Mann either. The idea that if there's a run of bad weather or satellite measurements of Arctic ice extent happen to coincide with a cyclical peak, it doesn't mean we wrecked the planet. Sometimes it's just coincidence. And indeed, an alert reader reminds us that back in 2016, the science section of Wired said, quote, thanks El Nino, but California's drought is probably forever, end quote. Then, in 2023, it went, quote, California's atmospheric rivers are getting worse. As climate change makes storms warmer and wetter, the state's flood control system is struggling to keep up, end quote. And yes, if you think every random event is part of the same pattern, even apparently contradictory events, you might be getting paranoid, including about climate. But sometimes it's just weather. In this week's newsletter, we also pass on that Chris Stark, the former head of Britain's Quango Climate Change Committee, just told The Telegraph that, quote, if you're a person going about your day-to-day -day life in Britain right now, I don't think your day-to-day -day life will be that different in 2050 when we hit net zero. There's not a huge shift here, end quote. Really? Because meanwhile, according to Euractiv, researchers urge Europe to embrace deindustrialization, end quote. So, here's the deal. People like us tried to warn that the energy transition would turn out more like the Flintstones than the Jetsons, even if politicians thought they could restructure the global economy based on a ride through the Epcot Center's Spaceship Earth. And then, when we were shown to be right, they said, yes, embrace rocks. No thanks. Meanwhile, CNN drops the platitude that, quote, it's not too soon to look ahead to summer weather, especially when El Nino, a player in last year's especially brutal summer, is rapidly weakening, end quote, and will soon essentially disappear. But then they say, quote, El Nino's disappearing act doesn't mean relief from the heat, not when the world is heating up due to human-driven climate change. In fact, forecasters think it could mean the opposite, end quote. Yeah, it could, unless it doesn't. And are these the same forecasters who didn't see the 2023 heat spike coming? In the newsletter, we also highlight a new paper by three figures familiar to CDN readers that presents a remarkably lucid short summary of the scientific case against climate alarmism. The three are Will Happer, distinguished Princeton Professor Emeritus of Physics, Stephen Coonan, Professor of both Business and Engineering at NYU and former Senior Obama Administration Scientist with a PhD in Theoretical Physics, and Richard Lindzen, Professor Emeritus of Atmospheric Science at MIT with a PhD in Applied Mathematics and former lead author with the IPCC, among, in all three cases, many other things. These are extremely distinguished people, and yes, they're climate scientists. Now, the paper we're talking about doesn't break new ground. What it does is summarizes the grounds for skepticism about climate policy, 
IPCC credibility, the reliability of climate computer models, and of claims that CO2 has made the weather worse and will only continue to do so. And we want to know what the alarmists have to say, especially the ones insisting that we follow the science. We looked at the popular alarmist D. Smog blog, and this is what it said on Linzen. Quote, The Cato Institute, a conservative think tank where Linzen has also published numerous articles and studies, has received at least $125,000 from ExxonMobil since 1998, end quote. On Happer, quote, William Happer has accepted funding from the fossil fuel industry in the past, end quote. On Kunin, quote, before working in government, Kunin spent five years, 2004 to 2009, as chief scientist for oil giant BP PLC, end quote. So, character assassination, not argument. Getting back to the science, the paper is not conclusive, nor is it groundbreaking. What it is, is a great general introduction to what we should all be talking about and debating, including whether it matters that the models don't predict temperature, or that, quote, CO2 becomes a less effective greenhouse gas at higher concentrations because of what in physics is called saturation, end quote. The paper is just 23 pages long, and yet it furnishes much valuable basic information, both about climate and about key climate controversies. For instance, that the United States has not seen an increase in heat waves recently, and that the worst decade in the modern instrumental record for American heat waves, by far, was the 1930s. So, if your local alarmist won't debate these points, won't look at these facts, or simply doesn't seem able to understand even the simple stuff and why it might matter, don't let them waste your time. They are not doing science. And now we growl, because the next installment in our Getting Worse series concerns polar bears. Remember those cute, cuddly, incredibly dangerous apex predator icons of the climate emergency that once roamed the frozen wastes of the far north until climate change wiped them all out? Yeah, unfortunately, in the late 1960s, there were still an estimated 12,000 polar bears spread out around the Arctic, but with disappearing sea ice disrupting spring and summer feeding, their numbers have plunged to... 32,000? Wait a minute, that's nearly three times as many. And then, in our ongoing look at Martin Durkin's Climate the Movie, The Cold Truth, we get to the claim that not all the weather records show the same amount of warming. Again, Ross McKittrick of the University of Guelph is quoted as saying, quote, you look at the weather balloon records, the satellite records, the rural records, the ocean records don't warm nearly as much as the land. All these indications show that the big warming pulse in the records is the Northern Hemisphere land record, and that's also where most of the data contamination is happening, end quote. So, we followed up with Professor McKittrick. We asked him to show us the numbers, and they fact-checked out. Here's a chart that he shared from Sunet et al. in 2023 that shows the combined rural and urban record for the Northern Hemisphere land surface on the left, and then the rural-only record for the Northern Hemisphere land surface on the right. Clearly, the left one rises faster, and crunching the numbers for how many stations there are in each category says that apparent urban warming is about 1.7 times as high as the rural stuff, which only allows for one explanation, and it's not CO2. Oh, and if polar bears are too scary, as they may very well be, we conclude with a CO2Science.org archive item on the giant panda, Alaropoda melanoleuca, which is native to China and is often portrayed by alarmists as also about to go under due to climate change. But in an area that did see warming and drying over 40 years, panda habitat did just fine. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and I think alarmism is for the birds. Mm -hmm.